Uh, as I just mentioned, my name is Erin Dunn. I'm the Associate Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at Telfair Museums. Um, and we're so thrilled to be the host institution for the exhibition that we'll be speaking about tonight. I did want to start out with a few thank yous. Um, first off, I wanted to say we're so grateful to Independent Curators International um, in New York City that helped travel the exhibition. Um, ICI is an organization that supports the work of curators to help create stronger art communities through experimentation, collaboration, and international engagement. I especially want to thank Becky Nahome for her assistance on the project. And also to all Telfair staff that played a pivotal role in organizing, thinking, designing, promoting, supporting, and presenting this exhibition. Thank you. The exhibition opens to the public tomorrow and will be on view at the Jepson Center through September 12th. So I really encourage you to come out and check it out when you can. Never Spoken Again, Rogue Stories of Science and Collections is a contemporary art exhibition that reflects on the birth of modern museum and scientific collections. The exhibition features an incredible lineup of internationally recognized contemporary artists who perform as artist scholars, opening a critique of material culture, iconography, and political ecologies. The exhibition also offers connections to Telfair's current exhibition, Progressive Regression, Examination of a 19th Century Museum, which seeks a renewed consideration surrounding human agency and how our histories and futures may be reimagined. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome you to this virtual opening for the exhibition. I know we may be a little tired of virtual openings at this point, but you know it is an incredible way to bring an international roster of people together. So we're so pleased to have David, Sophia, and Beatrice with us tonight. Um, I'm joined by the curator, David Ayala Alfonso, who will provide a short introduction to the exhibition um, and speak to the works in the show, um, and then begin a conversation with Sophia and Beatrice. David is a Colombian curator, artist, and researcher working between Bogota and London. He holds an MA in Visual and Critical Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a specialization in art education from the National University of Columbia. He is a guest curator at the Traveling Exhibition Program of Independence Curator International, and he is part of the editorial teams of the Journal of Visual Culture, Cultural Anthropology, and Emergencia. Ayala Afonso has been curator in residence and academic coordinator at Flora Ars Natura in Bogota, and he has lectured in different art schools in the US and Colombia. He's published books and articles on interface theory, Latin American art history, artist run spaces, performance studies, visual studies, urban sociology, anthropology of education, and artistic interventions in the public realm. He has been awarded the Fulbright Grant, the A AICAD Postgraduate Teaching Fellowship, the ICI Daedalus Award for Curatorial Research, and the Early Concept Grant for Exploratory Research um, at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And now on to Sofia. Sofia de Granada is a Chilean artist whose latest work have been developed from an environmental research interest using diverse media such as photography, installation, and printed publications. She holds a BA in visual arts from the Universidad Astral de Chile. Besides her work as a visual artist, she has worked on educational programs together with rural communities in the south of Chile. She has also worked with diverse educational institutions, including public schools, preschools, universities, and technical colleges. She's a co-director of Sagrada Mercancia, which is a collective space led by artists operating in Santiago de Chile since 2014. And finally, Beatriz Santiago Munez was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico and completed her BA in Humanities at the University of Chicago and received her MFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Her artistic practice in film and video arises out of long periods of observation, research, and documentation. Her work has been exhibited at the Tate Modern, the Whitney Biennial, um, and the Guggenheim. She is co-founder of Beta Locale, an organiz art organization and experimental education program in San Juan. Um, so thank you so much to you all for being here tonight. We're so pleased. Um, and I'm going to jump off screen now and allow you to start the presentation. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Oh, go ahead, Beatrice. Oh, no, I, I was just going to, uh, uh, what I wrote that I actually never completed my BA. I, I usually uh, make that clear in my CV, but you know, sometimes things get confused. 
I went straight to the MFA without finishing my BA. Oh. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Welcome everyone, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna extend my gratitude also to Erin and everyone at Telfer Museum for hosting the exhibition, for doing all the fantastic work that you've been doing, but that also extends to uh, ICI, everyone at ICI, but especially Becky Nahum, uh, exhibitions manager at ICI, who has been uh, not an incredible help, but also an inspiration to be able to carry this project through for uh, already like two years and a half. Um, I'm very grateful and happy to be in the company of that amazing team, but also in these incredible artists that are joining me tonight. Um, so just to give a, a glimpse of the exhibition, uh, I'm going to start doing um, something very, very quick, a walkthrough uh, with some installation shots uh, at the Telfer Museum, and then bear with me, and then I will uh, give the, the floor to Sofia and, and Bea to uh, try to make a conversation about uh, the experiential origin of, uh, or how works come to be through experience and through understanding and reading uh, a specific material reality. Uh, and then what kind of critique stems from there and, and how our specific reading of it uh, gives us clues of the material critiques that I'm trying to put forward in the exhibition. Um, so to begin very quickly, I'm going to share my screen uh, to show you some installation photos of what you'll be able to see at the Jepson Center starting tomorrow. Um, these are just some installation shots of, of the work of Daniel Small. Uh, very briefly, Daniel is uh, uh, doing this installation called Excavation 2 that uh, joins, uh, combines a number of elements that are um, all related to uh, the imagery of ancient Egypt. Uh, some of them come from a film set in the dunes of Guadalupe in Pomo in California. Uh, some are uh, kind of fun art that was created through the existence or, or because of the existence of that um, film set ruins in California. And some of the, the wall paintings or the, the wall works uh, that you see on the show come from uh, the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. And the idea of the work, the idea behind the work is that uh, we're kind of witnessing a sort of a archaeological excavation uh, that it's kind of bred into uh, an, uh, a complex or a number of artifacts that become important uh, for culture, not because they're archaeological objects per se, but rather because popular culture turns them into archaeology. Uh, and then like right through uh, Daniel's um, room, you'll see uh, <clears throat> The, the work of a Colombian artist Carlos Mota, um, who is doing uh, what would be colonially deemed as a uh, history from below, but, it, but with what is actually a uh, uh, history that uh, an enslaved person do, does through uh, about their journey to uh, Europe and then the Americas and, and uh, the ideas uh, behind the management of the bodies and the queerness. Um, a little bit before, uh, you see works by uh, the Iraqi American artist Michael Rakowitz, uh, the Turkish artist Erkan Nosnur, who is also uh, doing a kind of a fake excavation that uh, happens supposedly under Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. Uh, Michael's work is also quite famous, so I, don't, I think it also needs introduction. Uh, in this room, you will see a little bit of the work of Francois Boucher, a Colombian artist. Uh, who is interested in, in a number of histories that are non-canonical and by non-canonical I mean uh, they come from uh, various indigenous uh, theories of knowledge and epistemologies uh, about uh, their relationship to uh, the earth uh, and space. Um, and then you will find, to the right, you will find uh, a parrot that you cannot see quite well in this image, but um, the parrot is kind of like my rhetorical device or my story device, but I will talk about it uh, at the end of the, my presentation. Uh, it kind of gives way to all my thinking uh, behind the exhibition. And then in this image, you can see both Bea's and Sofia's work that um, 
in another installation, I have them one confronting the other because I think uh, they speak too well to, to one another. And I hope to, to get an opportunity to, to do this actually with them uh, during this conversation. Uh, and I will allow them, of course, to present their own work. Um, this is Sofia's work, the image to the right complements the, the structure, the metal structure uh, with the eucalyptus pockets uh, on the left. Um, Sofia will tell us a little bit more about that work. Uh, on the back, you will see the work of Reyes Santiago Rojas, a Colombian artist who is talking about the entire uh, circle of extraction, trade, the economies and the politics that needs to be created uh, during colonial times to create this complex of uh, sugar extraction and all the colonial economy that depends on it. And it, it kind of circles back to the production of soft drinks. Uh, and then all the way to the end, you see uh, the work of Ulrich Lopez, a uh, Puerto Rican Mexican uh, artist, uh, who is also in the exhibition with a work that critiques uh, the, how the ar archeological artifacts are deactivated when they are extracted from their context. And these particular objects are uh, gritones or screamers from uh, south of Colombia and other regions and they are supposed to be activated through the voice. So just to tear them out and put them in an exhibition, uh, the voids them from the original function. And he's trying to bring a little bit of that function back through the activation, through sound that he's doing in his installation. Um, I'm going to miss a number of works here. Uh, I'll just speak as much as the images allow me to. Uh, on the walls, you will see the work of Maria Teresa Alves, a resident artist who has a long trajectory of doing criticality of uh, the introduction of colonial structures in Brazil, uh, uh, but, and also the, the languages idea and the, idea, the ideologies and, the, and its consequences. And this specific work, is, uh, it's, uh, it's an investigation that she did in the Amazon uh, about the Salesian uh, schools that were indoctrinating indigenous children. Uh, uh, with many ripple effects. And, and uh, there's a long text that goes with the images that sp it speaks loudly about the effects of that indoctrination through a uh, uh, tribunal where the, the, that indoctrination was put to a legal test. Um, then this is, the, I guess, the entrance of the exhibition. And you will see a very small bird next to the next to the introductory test um, that belongs to uh, the Colombian artist uh, David Peña. And David did this kind of tropical bird. It, it's done in cinefoil, which is kind of a, like an aluminum foil, but uh, it, it serves to control the light. Uh, and it has a thermostat inside. And the idea of the bird is that it's kind of trying to um, hold the temperature uh, of its natural habitat. So you know, uh, a tropical temperature, but at the same time, the heat that it's put to the bird kind of like tears apart. It, it begins to lose shape. It begins to be destroyed only uh, through the, the actions that you do that, that, that are performed to keep that bird kind of like in captivity, like in a non-natural environment. Um, and then uh, all the way to the end, to the left, you see, uh, a little bit of the work of uh, the Puerto Rican uh, Kuwaiti artist Ali Farid, uh, who is interested in the uh, in the reflecting and imagining and fictioning the what uh, uh, the creation of a national collection uh, and a national art collection of a country would be like when you uh, when you're in an iconoclast country, a country that uh, is kind of uh, created ideologically against the production of images. Uh, and it's a mixture of things that she found in the Kuwaiti National Museum and also her personal archive. Uh, on the center, a very thin structure uh, uh, down of uh, Alia Faritz's work uh, is Claudia Peña Salinas, who is kind of investigating uh, the, the clash between uh, the, I guess, cultural paradigms between modernism and uh, the pre Columbian uh, epistemologies. So her works are usually. Uh, investigations of objects, artifacts, or sites the, uh, from uh, Central America and Mexico, uh, 
contrasted with these kind of modernist structures that you as a spectator complete when you stand in them or like confront them. Uh, and it also talks to, uh, speaks to all of the creation of, uh, you know, like touristic cultural imagery around it. Uh, all the way to the back behind uh, Reyes Santiago Muñoz, uh, you find the work of Giuseppe Campuzano, who was a, a theorist, a philosopher, an artist, and an activist, uh, trying to create what, what she would call a transvestite history uh, of Peru, um, trying to not only to incorporate the, the queerness that was censored from that history, but also kind of a like, opting for creating a queerization of the museum, uh, trying to, to destroy the structure that in, in the first place kind of prevented the, that uh, imagery to be there. Uh, I know I'm going to miss a few works, so uh, just to make room for a better conversation, uh, I'm just going to finish up here. Uh, just will leave you with the anecdote of the, of the bear because I want Sophia and Bea to speak to those anecdotes uh, and how, the, uh, how their works came to be through experience and how that experience read to a specific light uh, created these material critics and political critics that they are putting forward in their works. Uh, so when I was visiting the, I guess the museum for Natua Kunde in Berlin, the Natural History Museum, um, I was with this European group of curators uh, we were doing a workshop and we were uh, being given a tour of the, of the collection and the private collection behind it. Um, and I found uh, a bear that was supposed to be a Humboldt's bear, Humboldt's parrot. And Alexander for Humboldt, a prolific, uh, uh, I don't want to call it discoverer, but rather a traveler uh, of the Americas. Um, apparently, he gave this bear to a uh, a baron from Munich uh, because he, he kind of uh, shared his interest and his love for exotic birds. Uh, but there are a number of histories behind that bird, one being uh, that the bird was actually uh, kind of a war trophy that he took from a tribe that destroyed another tribe in what today is Venezuela. And the bird supposedly speak a language that was lost through that uh, war. Uh, and there's a legend that says that he spent a number of years of his life trying to um, identify the, the language of the bird and try to make sense of its structure and whatnot. Uh, but I, what, what I have learned through uh, people who are interested in birds and ornithologists is that birds are very social uh, beings. So what that means is that the bird was speaking something of a blend of what whatever he was bred into and then like the language of the tribe that he was brought to afterwards and then every experience of the life of the bird became whatever language so it was kind of like this future effort of trying to make sense of something that didn't exist and was already changing on time um, and um, when we were giving this tour and I was hearing these stories uh, I, I thought of two very simple but very strong ideas and the first one was that uh, that construction of histories is quite contingent. And the, the, the story and the legends of behind the bird were already speaking about that. Um, and the other uh, big idea that came from that was that uh, while everybody was entertained by the, by the story, uh, I was completely shocked by all the violence that was underpinning uh, the extraction of the species that they were showing us. Uh, so when we see a collection, we, uh, we very difficult, uh, we will have a very difficult time understanding tra or tracing back all of the lineage of colonial violence and all the uh, kind of world economies that are embedded and entangled in the creation of one collection. Not only through uh, the traditional critiques that are, that are related to their sponsorship, but also the way of the uh, acquisition or, or, and the extraction economies that are behind the creation of those large encyclopedical collections. So I don't know, it was quite shocking to me. It took me a while to create, you know, like a conceptual narrative of it. But finally, uh, through ICI's help, I could make it a, an exhibition in 2019. So with that said, I want just to give uh, the floor to Sophia and Bea, uh, as I would love to hear from them about um, what 
kind of stories or what kind of uh, experience uh, made them create created the encounter with the objects or the materiality or the or, or the spaces that they're investigating in their works um, and yeah just want to hear like the anecdotal uh, of that and see like how it needs and it develops into a theoretical framework maybe sofia can go first <laughs> okay i go uh, hello everyone um so my my story all all my work is is really related with the place that i was born i was born in the deep south of chile it's mostly the end of the world so it's a really strange um it's a landscape uh, very wild but at the same time very industrialized uh, so it's full of contradictions and opacities that I always try to, in some strange way, understand and, and live with. And I was there in, in a summer and I was having like a casual conversation um, in a very rural area. And I was asking for directions. And a woman pointed me a really, really big tree. And she told me uh, right there behind the millennial eucalyptus. And when I listened to the, the, the idea of a tree, uh, a millennial tree, but it's an eucalyptus that obviously cannot have a um, uh, thousand years because it's an industrial species. I, at the same time, was thinking about um, the needs that we have to build that kind of narratives. Uh, and I asked to myself at the same time, how many narrative of that kind of, um, uh, I don't know, feelings related to the inhabit of the, of the territory I have. So I, I start to study the, this idea of this, this eucalyptus um, in very different ways. Uh, in that time, I moved to Colombia, to Bogota, to make a residency there where I meet also David, and the trees were everywhere. For example, um, in the city, in the parks. So I started to collect. And then I started to think about um, in very different ways. In, in one way was uh, the industrial meaning. And I started to go to industries, to, I don't know the name of wood industries, like aserraderos, and when they produce in, in an industrial scale, the material. And the photograph that I have, I found it there. I was, I, I, I entered this, this space like asking for stories, talking, and, and, and in a tricky way, like asking for epic moments. And they start to tell me all this uh, epic narrative about uh, bring the electricity to the rural areas of Colombia. And I was super interested about the, about the idea that failed. Uh, Los Andes was so big that they can never uh, bring electricity to all the rural areas. So the photograph that is in the exhibition is uh, an example of this kind of effort uh, to bring these like vertical species that in some points is the, it's like the, it's a light pole at the 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 train rail is like this this is a it's a, it's a it grows so fast so that you can industrialize all the landscape within so that that was in some point all the things that I was thinking. And then the work took me to the toxicity, the toxicity of the, of the plant. And, and I was very interested in the idea of the visuality of the toxicity. Because in some point we always talk about it. No, it's just, eucalyptus is really bad, you know, but why, how? It's about the water, it's about the toxicity. And in some point you never see, we don't have the image of the toxic things. We don't, we, 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 we don't, 
we don't have the immediate image that like I don't know arsenic is yellow for example so I want I wanted to know how is the the color of the toxicity of this tree that um, when I started to understand why they bring this tree to Latin America there was like some kind of uh, hygienic idea of that uh, it's a very aseptic tree so it, it, it there were like narratives about this tree can clean the worm lands because the worm lands were in some point infected. So I was really interested about that. And, and they call them the white tree. You know, it's vertical, it's perfect, it's aseptic. So all of that ideas of clean and cleanness in our culture, I was really interested. And at least I find out that the toxicity was black, it was a really black and dark uh, fluid. And that chemistry is, is an alcohol, it's an ethanol. So it's really, uh, it disappears, you absorb it, and it's really black. So I start to produce massive amounts in the residency of, of this kind of materials and started to work uh, pieces that can hold this toxicity and bring the image uh, to all of us. That was, that's our, at some point, my stories about the pieces. Um, now I was, I was just, oh, that bit, are you ready? Yeah. I, I was, uh, wish I could see the, the work in person. It sounds really. Uh, it smells. <laughs> does it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the, all uh, the. I wish yeah. I could make smell vision films, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, listening to you speaking and thinking about um, the, the film that is in the show is called Pharmacopeia. Um, I made it in 2011, I think. I actually, before the talk, had to go back and watch it because I, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, and also because I, I, I work with certain ideas, like, like there are ideas in that film that come from a work right beforehand. And then like I made another film with Pablo Diaz Cuadrado, who's the man who appears in the film. And after that, I've kind of continued to work with some of these ideas in other works. They, they're not like, um, you know, they're not, they're not, not all of the things that you could think about it are in each of the films. So, but in, in this case, in the Pharmacopeia, I was thinking about the idea of, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in the city not necessarily knowing anything about how to differentiate one species from another of plants. You know, it was like tree, tree, bush, bush, small plants. That was my level of, you know, um, knowledge. And, and I was trained in, in, in art and, and architecture. And so I can look at a building from the 1970s, a brutalist building and kind of think about sort of the history that got us to this form but I didn't know how to, or even if you could do the same thing with um, the landscape. And of course, in a place like Puerto Rico, where there is, you know, almost no primary forest left, that's, you know, like if you, if you learn little by little, uh, you end up being able to, you know, look at like the, you know, Australian pines planted on the coast and recognize from what moment they were planted there and why, but then also, there's like the next step is figuring out what is not there anymore um, because it was um, uh, considered toxic and so eradicated. Um, and this is, that's kind of where I was, you know, when I was making that film was, you know, how can I think about uh, the history of ideas that have formed the place where I live and how I look at it not just through the ideas proposed by humans, but by plants as well. Um, so uh, like what the plant is, what the plant is doing, uh, what the tree is doing. So, I mean, the, this, this film is literally like a collection of plants that are uh, grown, farmed by this man, Pablo Diaz Cuadrado with them. Um, some uh, stories uh, that are woven, that are woven in. Um, 
there are there's for example uh, a tree that used to cover the coast of puerto rico a lot of the caribbean uh, the scientific name is ipomane mancinella and it is a it is a tree that is supposedly so toxic that every single part of it can kill you you know like if you if you fall asleep underneath it and it rains, you will go blind. If you eat its fruit, you will die. You know, all these, uh, uh, it has all of these uh, different effects. It still, it was completely, you know, eradicated from almost the entire coast. Um, and I wanted to find, I wanted to find it. I wanted to photograph it. I called, um, well, anyway, this is a funny story. I was calling around uh, in the uh, to the Guardabosque. How do you call the Guardabosque in in forest in, ranger maybe a forest ranger in charge of the, the the dry forest? He had been there for thirty years, so he knows the dry forest very well. And I told him that I really wanted to find this tree to photograph it to see it, you know, just to have an idea of what it looked like in the in the landscape and you know he said no we don't have we we took care of all those a long time ago we don't have any of those left and he he must have we, we hung up and maybe like a couple of hours later he actually called me back this almost never happens because it seems like he had solved the problem right there um and he said okay i do i do have one that i was supposed to cut but i did not um if you come tomorrow uh, me and another worker will, will take you there. Um, the other worker would remember because he had brushed up against it and had to go to the hospital for burns. Um, so, and, and so I did go down and he took me there and that's just a few seconds of images in the film. Um, and it is a completely, it's like an insi insipid, you know, like it would not, it does not announce its, um, its toxicity to you in, in any way. Um, it looks uh, almost like the emahaguilla, which is a very common tree. It's very, so it would be very easy to mistake it with another. Um, so uh, I, the, the, the protagonist of the, of the film is the idea of this collection that have shaped the landscape, this collection of plants for different reasons. So the tobacco plant for, you know, for other reasons, uh, and uh, and the Brugmansia, which is uh, a ha ha hallucinogenic uh, flower for for others. Um, I went. I've gone back and made another film with with Pablo, and um, and there's something that he says in the second film that I made with him in Matrulla uh, about his beekeeping. Um, that the bees chose him rather than than he them, and anyway, I I, I mean I could talk a, a bit more about um, my idea was to think to think with him. I don't have the kind of relationship with plants that he does, but in paying attention to him, I could get a bit closer to his more sort of uh, co-thinking, you know his way of thinking with the plants that he works with and with the animals that he works with. Thank you. Something that I found really remarkable, I think uh, that it shows in, in both uh, your stories in different ways is how um, very experiential um, encounter with uh, what we think of as nature or the natural that it's not and hasn't been for quite long, uh, whatever we think natural is, uh, it takes us to the necessity of understanding what natural means, but also what, the, what we are witnessing. But that then takes us to a very complicated politics behind um, the existence of nature or whatever you want to call it as they are, like the existence of eucalyptus that in the Andes we give it for granted because they're everywhere, but they're Australian, they shouldn't be there. There's, uh, there's an industrial background to it. Same with the idea of the tropic. The tropic is supposed to be something of which we have a fixed image, but in, but in reality, it's something that has been uh, kind of uh, 
manicured in a way that it resembles that fantasy of the Caribbean. Uh, and the, those two politics that stem from there are quite complicated, they're quite violent, uh, not only for the natural or the nature, uh, but also for uh, the territories and the communities that inhabit it. And that's something that, you know, like I would love to hear a little bit of that connection, how you, so, how you do it, Sophie, how you do it there. Like, uh, thinking about the work, not necessarily in the film, not necessarily in the sculpture, but that are in the thinking process of the work. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really, it, it, in some point, that build uh, most more contradictions and more opacities in the relation that I build with the place that I inhabit. You know, and for example, uh, there are like two examples that I can give that also bring us like images that makes me think about that. Um, one is the idea of the cows, for example, that is something that I'm really working right now. And you have a, the, this kind of idealistic idea of the cow of very peaceful, you know, and, and, and a very, um, I don't know, innocent animal and, and the milk and the and all the European also image related to that you know the fields the milk the chocolate and in my uh, memory of the cows uh, the first one is all the wounded for example legs of the cow and they use uh, blue methanil for the animals so all the all the legs of the cows were purple so my image uh, of nature is this kind of landscape with all these animals painted in a big strong blue purple uh, who smells really smells like a chemistry so I think um, that's an example for some for instance and, and another thing that I was uh, thinking about what you say is that um, also talking with the people who work in this kind of plantations is the the fact that the eucalyptus uh, grow so fast that one person can see in his life like three cycles complete of growing and disappear of a woods, you know? That's, that for me is very interesting. It's like, is that natural or, or not? It's like the, the question is, it doesn't matter, but the, the process also visually is super interesting. Like imagining in, in one life see three times a complete wood grow and disappear it's, it's something that we are not like culturally understand how in time that could happen but it happened and and also these kind of things happen related to industry or, or some this kind of um coexistence uh, of of this kind of contradictions and and also really violent process so i don't know if, if that answered your question that that, that example <laughs> Yeah, I think I think here uh, the idea of talking about like you know the 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 dialogue around like preservation conservation um, uh, is really is it gets nuts you know because right now what we have is a kind of Frankenstein ecology you know there's really no way to separate one from the other you cannot anymore at all say oh these are native trees we're going to cut these down and plant something else that used to be here because nobody really knows or knows even that it's possible to i mean the climate has actually changed so much that we don't know if it could even sustain what used to be here um so i mean it's i i was making a, a project recently that is about uh, a species of magnolia that is in um, danger of extinction, that is in, in endangered. Um, and, you know, of course, one of the reasons why it's endangered here, it's a, it's a, there's two uh, endemic magnolia species here, is because of uh, forestry. But then also through a kind of break in the symbiotic relationship, a uh, a giant crow that used to be also endemic to Puerto Rico has disappeared. And this giant crow was the disperser of the, of the seed. So even if you attempt to uh, preserve certain, uh, the, the individuals, we don't know if 
all the other elements have already been transformed so much um, the way of that it would be possible. I, I, I'll tell another really weird story about, um, I mean, collecting is strange. Botanical gardens are really strange. The idea of creating collections of things is bizarre. Um, and in, in, in botany, is, it gets even it, it naughtier, you know? Um, I was commissioned to do a project with the, the, the Huntington, which is both a, a rare book collection and a, a botanic garden. And this is how I started working with the Magnolia, because when I was there, I, I saw that they were working on a, a, a cryopreservation project of all species of Magnolias. The, I never actually spoke to the curator of Botanical Garden, but I, I, I read a few interviews and he talked about the idea of having a frozen garden in wait, you know, and this is the idea behind seed vaults as well, you know, uh, if we, if the, if the, if our species, the alive ones, the ones that are growing now were to disappear, then we have this, this seed, you know, ready, this is an amazing image, no, a frozen garden. Um, and so they have done a few, a few visits to Puerto Rico to uh, collect um, the equivalent of a stem cell of a, of a tree, which is like when, when you see a, a branch growing, like the little knob, you know, that has, a ver has, has cells that could become anything. And you can actually take a piece of that and divide it into a thousand pieces. And all of those in theory through cryopreservation would become trees. The, the, the woman who is in charge of this project is a brilliant uh, 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 Spanish uh, botanist. And um, this is really amazing watching her do this as well. The thing is they have come to collect uh, the uh, cells from the magnolia trees and some seeds as well that already went through a really um, traumatic event, the hurricane. Um, and they took this material to the Huntington and they, and I saw, you know, this, this growing up to about here. The thing is, once they get to be like plantulas about this big, they all die, absolutely all of them. Wow. Because as they have come to realize, there is a really um, important mycorrhizal, you know, fungal system the, the, the magnolias live very, the, each individual very far away from the other, but they must be connected through uh, to the community uh, through uh, this fungal system. So it's interesting, I was asking them, and what do you do now? You know, of course, the answer would be, well, you just have to preserve the actual place where the, but no, it's actually bringing earth there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where the idea of collection, you know, mm. you know, and the idea of, you know, where it becomes a priority to collect, uh, classify and have every species, as opposed to thinking about, you know, the entire system and making sure that the entire system is somehow, you know, still um, uh, simply connected, you know. I, and then I found here in the forest where those magnolias tree, magnolia trees are, the, the, another woman who is in forestry, uh, really the, 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 the guardian of that place where the, um, where the magnolias are. And, you know, the first thing she said to me is, oh, well, the idea of even preserving the seed itself, you know, as like, this is the frozen garden is, is wrong because in the tropics, it is not in, in the form of the seed, but in the form of a plant about this large that, the, that it can last the longest, you know, that it can last 40 years, 60 years waiting for its moment to have, you know, sun and space. So even, so anyway, all this to say that maybe even our ideas of what is the beginning and what must be preserved as the seed, like we have, it is actually comes from a different, from temperate climates that don't, don't actually uh, uh, translate to the forms of preservation that would be useful. I would have never thought that the seed was an idea, like an idea that there is an ideology around, you know, 
the idea of seed as beginning, you know, I didn't think to question that until I, I heard her. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, I think at the same time, um, we can think the property of the land, like we divide the land, we put limits, we can understand in some point, uh, the, the land, for example, as a collection. When you make divisions in the south, you have this uh, uh, natural conservancy places that are completely closed. But in some point, the insects, the seeds, the birds, they don't give, you know, they, they move. All the species are moving all the time. You never see the same landscape. So I think uh, this is very important to uh, start to get into this kind of really small process, but they are really meaningful for us to understand what's really happening there. You know, it's like, um, for example, another weird thing is like in Chile, the weapon that the police use to, um, to hit the people, it calls Luma, which is a, na a native tree that is the most hard like tree that you can find. So also you can make relations uh, with this idea of the, na the native spatial with some things and the, with some uh, really brutal things of our culture, you know? It's not, the, the idea of something native uh, is always like uh, um, the right thing in some point, you know? It's something that I think we must, uh, we must doubt about it. Uh, actually these days more than ever. Mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing how we, uh, how through your stories, everything that um, relates to the understanding of nature of, uh, through the human, it's kind of like unfolds or like falls down. Uh, Bea, you made me think about uh, grandmothers in, in Latin America that would like steal stems and branches of plants to plant them on their own. And like that there was like a natural uh, there was not only a kind of natural connection to knowledge on like transmission of verbal knowledge that would allow for this to happen and to prosper, um, but also the soil uh, as the, the less managed that it was, uh, the more prosperity it would have. And there's something very interesting about what Sophia said, which is a natural reserve is basically where the humans are not. Um, so the idea of creating a collection uh, such as uh, seed bank, that seed bank in, I can't remember, like in, in the Baltic Sea, that, that was supposed to be, you know, like Sval for, Svalbard. Svalbard. Yeah. Hope for future humanity, it like something defroze there, like the electricity, the power went out, they lost a, a, a huge uh, lot of uh, seeds. Uh, still, the systems that we put in place uh, mm -hmm. are coming from the understanding that we have about managing nature. Mm -hmm. that nature, the, the way that the seed keepers do it, for example, in Colombia is that they just allow the species to grow back and again. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. so uh, I think it's very interesting just to see through the, the, the histories that you're telling us, um, how, how the politics of the human of, of creating uh, not not sustainable, but 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 rather uh, useful uh, forms or useful trajectories of growth and regrowth just end up in, in in doesn't really matter how sophisticated they are they end up in a form of destruction and even like the idea of removing a, a tree that is deemed as toxic that toxicity is there because it fulfills a function right. Yeah, the, also the, the reason why it was, I mean, it was taken, uh, it was cut down by the, the, you know, through Spanish colonization, but it was used by uh, indigenous people as, as poison <laughs> um, the, for, for defense. So it was a way of destroying the weapon, no? Um, uh, one, one thing I wanted to say too about the, that I that I learned through this project is that the seed, you know, seed preservation is like is just like preserving a photograph, you know, because you know if you are, you know, if the plant is growing and it, then it will be co-evolving with the climate with other plants around it, etc. But if it's um, 
if you if you just take this moment, you know, it, it's just like if we preserve the magnolia now, um, it might not actually be uh, ready to. Um, it, it may not be. It, it may not be adapted. It may not be adapted to the climate at the moment when it is um, when it is needed. Yeah. Speaking of photography, you should definitely visit the exhibition and see Sophia's work, uh, because she's capturing this moment in which uh, one a post of eucalyptus is being transported through by a chopper, uh, and that moment I think is very important because it not only signals all of what she's Sophia is trying to do through uh, uh, the other piece, the Aguilon, and with the, the eucalyptus extract, but but also how that chemistry is connected to the political history of a, laying out uh, power lines for mines, right? So the land is being managed to be kind of a colony where minerals are extracted and so on and so forth. And that, that's why a certain nature, nature is introduced and tribes is there. Uh, but yeah. I don't know, thinking about yeah. preservation of moments. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you want to add something, Sophia, before we run No, no, it's yeah. okay. Uh, so there's there's a question uh, in our chat that I want to read for you too. Uh, it's by Joshi Rating. Thank you, Joshi, for being here. Um, Hello, and, Joshi. Uh, Joshi asks, I am wondering how, since we are understanding a so-called nature as a construction and also as a new Franken nature, how does this false idea of indigenous or native plants reflect on the ideas of or of indigenous or native peoples? At what point is a person or thing indigenous? And is there some critical measure of, of this or is it a call, is it all, always a construction? I, I, I guess I, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm not a botanist, but I would say that the, that the idea of like indigenous and endemic is still useful. It's just that the idea of a kind of return to a moment where we were the only, you know, I mean, we, we We'd have to we'd have to cut down, you know, the the few forests that have uh, grown back after like a really um, impactful uh, agricultural one hundred years. You know, it, it the the problem is really the idea of a kind of restoration. You know, a kind of a possibility of going back to a a, a previous you know uh, balanced time. Which, which I think, because of the changes that have that the landscape and climate have already undergone, are not possible. I, I, I want to say to that that in in the Puerto Rico became a kind of laboratory for secondary forests and for this, um, because the agricultural that kind of monoco monoculture of agriculture um, sort of broke down so quickly in the 1970s, and so there's this patchwork, you know of like, you know, preserved land with something that used to be a pineapple plantation, but now is like 20 years of growth. And, and because things go so quickly in the tropics. And so there are, there are uh, uh, botanists and people that study uh, secondary forests that have dedicated themselves here to studying the ways that non-native plants restore uh, the land as a and you know theoretically like this is a, a, a hypothesis will would make the the soil and the you know the combination of elements more propitious for uh, indigenous plants uh, to be able to to grow another example that I, I thought of, of from something that Sophia said about time um, is that uh, there's there's somebody here who's been studying as, as uh, a species that grows only in the dry forest here and that because of the climate here in the south grows really really slowly like the, in 60 years we've only seen one one reproductive cycle versus you know the three in in one lifetime that you were mentioning about eucalyptus so uh, and and right now there's a plague like a fungus plague all over all of these trees in the south but what this um, botanist is advising is that we do not do absolutely anything about it because we don't know if this is part of a hundred year cycle. Like we don't know if this is sickness or health. So 
I guess th that's sort of the same uh, thing about like, well, well, what makes us so sure that we should intervene in the process of, you know, uh, non-native trees taking over? Perhaps this is what the trees know that we don't, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. at, at, the, at any rate, we cannot be sure in, in this example of the you know the fungus we cannot be sure that this is not part of a hundred year or 200 year pattern because it has not been recorded for more than 60. something that that is really related to the question that i can i can compare at some point is that i think um, Occidental culture is super obsessed about the image and about the form because they see a plant and, and for example, the, the eucalyptus uh, was seen as, as the form of a, per, of a perfect vertical piece for industry, but they don't get in the, they, they stay only in the form. But if you go in, in another relation with nature that I think is related to native cultures, when the nature is something not that you see or that you use, it's something that you drink, for example, or something that you eat every day, then you start to realize that, for example, when you have a lot of eucalyptus, I start to smell and I like ammoniac. And I, at first, and when I was in Florida, I start to think that it was a cat because it smelled like cat pee. And I was like, why <laughs> there's a cat the cat is ruining my experiment and i was super like um, an horrible person with that cat like and then i start to realize that the plant has a lot of ammoniac and the ammoniac is the same that is in the pee of the cat and actually in my pee we have arsenic in our body but what we have ruined is the relation and the understand about it's all the same materials, but it's only in different form of way. So this idea of also um, the, the iconic idea of the native spaces and the belonging is because we only we only see that part, you know, of the of the of the super occidental idea of the form. This this kind of naturalistic idea of drawing the leaves and on the form of the leaves and the collection and the but the real like deal with nature is what's happened in the relation, the material relation that we build with the land and when the, and and when the species at the same time. Mm. Because we cannot escape in some point of that I think so that, that's that's the. That's what I'm thinking about the the question. Yeah. I don't know if there's any other question on the round. Something very pressing as we are closing. Well, that was incredible. Thank you all so much for that discussion. Um, if there, you know, another question, we'd be happy to take it now. But it is seven o'clock. Oh.